Now, if you've got your outlines, hopefully you do. If you miss them, there's a couple out there uh, on the uh, on the table. That'll uh, give you a guide as to where we're going. As we get into the sixth chapter, sixth chapter is very interesting because the sixth chapter you're going to read, as we were going to read, starts off with a very familiar, to most of you probably, a story about the feeding of the 5,000, where Jesus takes the young man's lunch, as it were, five loaves of barley bread, two little fish, and multiplies that. Um, there's a whole lot, here's a shock, there's a whole lot more to this story than just simply Jesus being compassionate and meeting the needs of people relative to their, their physical hunger. Uh, there's a whole lot more to this. In fact, this has everything to do with the deeper, I suppose, theological and doctrinal truths that as we get into the sixth chapter, you get to verse 37, get into verse 40, 44, all the way down to 65, where Jesus is speaking very strongly in terms that we are familiar with, if you want to look at it, 637, all that the Father gives me will come to me. The one who comes to me, I will certainly not, or I will not, not cast out. Notice that it's the, the only ones that can come to him are those whom the Father gives. Now that means the Father is working prior to the individual coming. The Father is pulling the strings. He is sovereign and we are not. And then down to uh, verse uh, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. I'll raise him up on the last day, so on and so forth. Throughout this entire context right here, as we begin at the beginning of chapter 6, and we talk about bread. We talk about the temporary nature of earthly bread compared to the eternal nature of true bread. And that's why I've titled this section as we get into it, Temporary Bread versus True Bread. Of course, the true bread is who? The Lord Jesus. And he makes that statement down in verse 48, if you just want to follow along a little bit here. I am the bread of life, he says. And then 50. This is the bread which comes down out of heaven so that uh, one may eat of it and not die. 51. I am the living bread that came down out of heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. The bread also which I give for, my, uh, for the life of the world is my flesh. And so he come, I've moved you ahead so you can see where we're going here. He comes right out with it. This feeding of the 5,000, you know, the Matthew's account, Mark's account of the feeding of the 5,000 does not have this tagged onto a teaching that John presents right here. It's one of the things I love about John. Uh, so unique. There are some similarities with the other synoptic gospels, the three synoptics, but John stands out as giving us additional information that is sort of within the grooves of all the other teachings that are there in the synoptic accounts. So it's very illuminating. At the same time, John doesn't give everything, say, that Matthew might give or Mark or, or Luke might give, and so we are going to slip back into Mark's account about this feeding of the 5,000 to give further illustration and add more you know, buzz to this thing in regards to uh, uh, the, uh, the historic presence of what took place that day on the side of this mountain uh, right near the Sea of Galilee, also known as Tiberias. So, the feeding of the 5,000 and the people's reaction to being fed, you know, they recognize, we'll see it in a little bit here, they recognize that Oh, there was like these gnarly little five pieces of dried up barley bread and these two stinking little pieces of fish. I'll show you why I'm saying that in just a second. And he just fed upwards to maybe 10,000 people. Completely impossible, correct? Oh, yeah, completely impossible. For with God, all things are possible. But for the natural man, it's completely impossible. And for the believer who is not thinking Christ's thoughts after him, it's impossible. That's right. You can be a believer and not be thinking his thoughts according to the word after him, and it's impossible. And we'll deal with some examples of that as we go along right here. And then the people see this happen, and right away, they want to force him to be king. They're going to seize him and make him king. Because what you've got here is these people are looking at this, and they're going, not only do we have this great miracle worker who can teach real good too, but we got a guy who can make food. And we are, we're on the edge of the biggest social welfare system in all of Judean history. And I think I can spend lots of time on my hammock in my house. Because Jesus will just bring me my food. <clears throat> the, the contrast that John wants to give us here between physical earthly bread, temp, meeting a temporary need, contrasted then with the eternal bread, the person of Christ, which is not temporary, 
but is eternally lasting. And there's your contrast that's going on. Now, it, this for no small reason that this uh, account of the feeding of the 5,000 opens up this sixth chapter. Because all of the doctrine concerning salvation, predestination, election that is presented here, as we get into verse 37 and following, is all based upon the bread that comes down from out of heaven. It's based upon that. He's the mediator of that. This is, eat of me and you get life everlasting. This is the bread that the Father is offering to those, like Jesus said, um, who he is giving to the Son. Verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me. Therefore, according to the grammatical construction here, if you come to Christ, it's because the Father has given you to him. That automatically means that if you don't come to Christ, then it's because the Father has not given that person unto Christ. It also draws a stark, bold, dark line limiting who can come to Christ. It's all within the purview of the Father. Now, that doesn't mean that all of a sudden the person's will is out of it. But remember, regeneration always precedes faith, according to Scripture. Regeneration always precedes faith. Faith is not the doorway to regeneration. It's the, it's the opposite, as we have learned in several places, in Paul and earlier in John chapter 3 and so on and so forth. And so when God does this and grants that regeneration, what is regeneration but the changing of the person's nature? See, that's what 2 Corinthians 5.17 is talking about. When you're a new creation in Christ, old things pass away. Well, as we have been learning the last few Wednesday nights and then Sunday before last, part of that old thing passing away is the body of, of sin, that, that old fallen in Adam nature that is removed. But what remains? Well, Paul says it's what? Romans 7.23. It's the principle of sin or the law of sin. Those are, not, those are mutually equivalent things. They're not the same. The principle of sin and the fallen in Adam nature are two different things. But according to Colossians 2.11, you've been circumcised with the circumcision of Christ, that circumcision being the removal of the body of sin, or the body of the flesh, excuse me. And that's just another way of saying the fallen nature. So this has to be removed. You're given a new nature, and that's why you are now willing. <laughs> because the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit of God, neither can he know them. They're foolishness to him. They have to be spiritually understood. But if you're natural, you will never make a decision for Jesus. Because you're natural. You don't understand the things of the Spirit of God. And then you got Romans 5, 10, and 11, which says you know, that we are enemies of God prior to regeneration. We're, we're, we're God-haters. God-haters. We're born that way. I'm wondering how far to go down this rabbit trail. Let's return to the text. <laughs> Let's read the text. John 6, starting at verse 1. This is all part and parcel of this feeding of the 5,000. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Then Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Philip answered him, Two hundred denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There's a lad over here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are these for so many people? Jesus said, Have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus then took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were filled, he said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled twelve baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. Therefore, when the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the world. So Jesus, perceiving that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain by himself alone. 
So let's see if we can follow this train of thought of temporality relative to the contrast of temporal earthly bread and the eternal bread that came to us down from heaven. What's the contrast and why is he making a connection between these two things? First, let's consider on your outline right there the testimony of temporary bread. The testimony. Temporary bread is going to testify to something. It's going to bear witness to something to us in this text. It's going to, it's going to teach us something, educate us something about the contrast and the necessary contrast in regards to all of this. Look at verse 1 now. After these things, and of course these are the things of, of chapter 5 in the most part, but in particular uh, from verse 18 all the way down to verse 47, these things in particular. And by the way, by the time chapter 5 verse 1 begins to chapter 6 verse 1, you've got approximately six months of biblical timeline that has gone by. So within one chapter, chapter 5 contains about six months uh, worth of, of, of uh, history and teaching and events within the life of Christ. Now obviously, this is an overview in regards to chapter 5, but that's a six-month period from the time of the healing of the Seda all the way down to chapter 6, verse 1. So after these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. Now he was down in Jerusalem, so there's some, some uh, time that went by that's a little bit unrecorded right there. Um, he, Jerusalem, some couple hundred miles you know, south uh, of, of the Sea of Galilee. Sea of Galilee, also known as Tiberias, named uh, about A.D. 26 as the uh, Lake or Sea of Tiberias, as well as the Sea of Galilee, and was named that by Herod Antipas, who built the city of Tiberias, uh, on the northeast side of the Sea of Galilee. And then the sea be eventually be started taking on the name of Tiberius. Tiberius Caesar being one of, the, one of the Caesars. And Herod Antipas, because he was essentially kissing up, uh, did this for him. So it took on that name. That's why it has that name right there. So Jesus is way up in Galilee. He's outside of the Judean area. He's up by Galilee now. And it says in verse 2, And a large crowd followed him, because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. Now, <clears throat> notice right away why the crowd is there. It just says, a, a large aklo, a, a large crowd. Why are they there? Because they saw something. What did they see? They saw signs. Sound like a, a familiar teaching that we've done here before, earlier on in, in John? Remember the teaching, signs don't save? They're for a purpose. Uh, Acts 2.22 says that the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, was attested to by God through signs, wonders, and miracles which God did through him. In other words, attested that he was God's son, that he was attested by God that he was God in the flesh, attested that he was the biblical uh, Old Testament Messiah come to life, come to minister. There was the uh, attestation. That is the primary purpose of signs. And we went through all the details of that before. We also talked about the effect that these signs had on crowds. And we took you back to the beginning of that in John 2. I want you to look at it real quick. John chapter 2 and verse 23 to 25. John 2, 23 to 25. Now watch this. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, this would have been the first Passover of his ministry, his ministry time from the age 30. During the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs, which he was doing. And then remember how in the next verse, it's now going to be qualified by John here, what is meant by what kind of believing that was going on with these people as they observed his signs. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. Remember, entrusting there, that's epistusen in Greek. Uh, it means that he was refusing, it's an imperfect negative type of tense, uh, he was refusing essentially um, to uh, entrust himself to them. Um, the root here is belief. Pistu or pistis. Epistusen gives you the whole form of the word right there, which gives us our, our tense form. Um, he was continuously refusing to give faith back to them is the idea. So the gift of faith for salvation was not being given. He would not epistusen, entrust, 
or give faith back to them, for he knew all men. In other words, the reason they were 23, believing in his name, was for the wrong reason. They observed the signs. They saw the wonders, you see. That is not saving faith. That's wow. That's just wowism. Cool. What else can he do? It's a, it's a sort of entertainment. Uh, verse 25, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. Well, what is in man? Well, Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart of man is deceitful and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Uh, man, is, man is depraved, the Bible says. And, and, and his wanting to believe is, is not a saving belief in that context right there. All right, now we followed that, we've looked at that a few times before in the past, and we followed that through up to, to this point. The crowds are still kind of the same way. That doesn't mean there aren't some people in the crowds that the Lord is not drawing, uh, that the Father is not drawing to the Son. Of course there is. Okay, but in the main, we're being uh, emphasized here in John, the sixth chapter, that the people are, are looking to Jesus as this miracle worker, as this one who has authority with his word to cast out demons, you see, uh, that he's raising the dead, and so on and so forth. And it's a big deal. Um, we are one year at this point, and I'll show you how I know that. We are, with John chapter 6, we are one year into Christ's ministry, out of his three plus years of ministry before his crucifixion. We're one year into it. Uh, people from, according to the end of uh, Matthew 4 in the timeline, the beginning of Matthew 5 as we start on the so-called Sermon on the Mount, uh, we've, got, we've got crowds of people, of Gentiles, hearing about him. They're coming to him out of Syria. They're coming out of other regions. Um, the crowds are building up. This is a very electrical time relative to his, uh, his ministry and the people who were following hard after him for this. Some following for the right reasons, many most were not. Part of the reason for that had to do with the wrong understanding that the Jews had, especially those in the Sanhedrin, the mixture of the uh, scribes and the Pharisees and the Sadducees in regards to, in particular the Pharisees, in regards to the type of Messiah that they were expecting. They were expecting an earthly Messiah, a man to come. They weren't expecting God in the flesh. They were not expecting Emmanuel. But they were expecting a man to come and to be this ruler who would throw the yoke of Roman oppression off of them and put the nation back on top as the head of the nations and this kind of a thing. And they were expecting a Messiah to come and take care of all their problems. Um, of course, Jesus didn't come here for that. But this is something they were expecting. So here they see this Jesus doing what he's doing, and they're attaching themselves to him in regards to that. So back in chapter 6, in verse 2, this large crowd which was following, they were following because they saw the signs, not because they were being drawn to him by the Father necessarily, not because faith was coming, because of his teaching, but they were overwhelmed by the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And of course, at, in that time, at that culture, this was huge. You know, people were destitute back then. Sickness was just was rampant. Um, that was the majority situation back there. Um, people were desperate. And so here comes Jesus uh, extending the direct hand of God. And remember Jesus said earlier in John chapter 5, I can do nothing unless I see the Father do it. I don't do anything on my own initiative. If I do something, it's because I see the Father do it. So Jesus is healing people, um, correcting the situation all across the board, because he sees the Father doing it. And the people are just overwhelmed with this. Never seen anything like it, of course, in their life. They're just overwhelmed. Of course, it's going to attract an interest. Verse 3 now, John 6, 3. Then, notice now, this is hot on the heels of verse 2. I don't want you to miss this. Here's this crowd following Jesus for the wrong reason. Then, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Are you catching what's happening? Uh, then, in the New American Standard, actually the Greek text has got a conjunction right in front of that. It's, it's pronounced day, and day sounds like day or night, right? But it's uh, delta epsilon. The day as a conjunction can be translated as then. That's okay. Uh, in this context, it's also possible to translate it as rather, or on the other hand. So here comes the crowds in verse 2 seeking after him because of his powers, because of the signs, because of the healings. And now verse 3, on the other hand, Jesus went up on the mountain. How come he didn't just meet the crowd? I mean, these people are for him. 
Do you see them? They're all holding, you know, yay Jesus now signs and stuff like that, you know? I mean, they're just all over this. But rather, on the other hand, instead of going after them, Jesus goes up on top of the mountain. Interesting, because he removes himself from the populist kind of notion, you know, clearly he's not running for office because he's trying to avoid all of that type of attention. Um, this has a lot to do with why, in the other gospel accounts, Jesus would tell his disciples after he performed something or a teaching or performed a miracle, he would say, don't tell anybody who I am. Because the expectation of the people was, when the Messiah comes, he's going to be this earthly ruler, he's going to be this king, he's going to overthrow the oppression of Rome. That's not why I'm here. So he's constantly removing himself from that type of a scenario. Because he came to die. He came to overcome death, the Adamic death, and he came to satisfy God's righteous requirement for all sin of all those whom God would draw to the Son. So Jesus goes up. He doesn't meet them. He gets up on top of the mountain. We don't know which mountain this was. Basically, this is sort of Golan Heights kind of area um, for in modern terms, where he is right now. Um, he's up there somewhere, and there it says, he sat down with his disciples. Now, of course, you're familiar with that. You okay? Okay. All right, you had your hand on your... Okay. Just want to make sure. Yeah? That's because she hears me. She's like, let me out. She'll get right back in as soon as she sees me. I mean, you know. What? I was just heading for this? Back inside. It says, and there he sat down, bottom of three, with his disciples. And you'll recognize this as his normal teaching posture. Most uh, of the Jewish teachers, of course, would do that. Instead of standing in a pulpit or at a lectern or something like that, they would sit down uh, in the synagogues, and Jesus practiced that freely outside uh, of the synagogue. So he sits down with his disciples. He's not going to pull any miracles. No divine rabbits out of the hat. Now it's time for the word. Now it's time for the word. He sits down with his disciples. Now keep in mind also that, and in this context, when he refers to the disciples, he is referring to the twelve. But many times in the Gospel accounts, disciples extends beyond the twelve. There are others who were followers of Christ, who were matetes, uh, translated as disciples. Those are disciplined ones. Also, those who are learning. That's what a disciple is, is a learned, learning, disciplined one. Um, which says a lot, by the way, contrary to the current posture of an awful lot of Christians in the church. <clears throat> So he sits down with his disciples. I, I say that's who Jesus sits down with, are those, those who are his learners, those who are disciplining themselves uh, there with him. Verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Uh, remember I told you just a little bit ago uh, that uh, from chapter, at the beginning of, of chapter 6 right here, actually from, from chapter 5, through chapter 6, you've got that six-month period that's going on right here. And now we have, verse 4, now a reference to the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was near. When I started this uh, book with you, I told you that the book chronologues three-plus years in the life ministry of Jesus. And I showed you how we figured that out, out of John's Gospel. Uh, the first year is, at the beginning of the first year, is chronologued for us in chapter 2, verse 23 where that first Passover is mentioned, chapter 2, verse 23. And from that point on up to this point represents the first year. The second year is represented right here in chapter 6 and verse 4. This is now the second year, or um, the second year where the second Passover of his ministry is, is occurring. Year 3 will be referred to in chapter 11 and verse 55. Chapter 11 and verse 55. <clears throat> and so we get just a little bit past that, and that's why you will hear off-the-cuff statements. Preachers will say, Jesus' ministry was for like three and a half years. Now, um, I think that's probably a little too long. I don't have a real problem with it, but it was just a hair past three years. That's for sure and for certain if we follow John's chronology in particular. So we've got year two. This is year two of his ministry. We're better than a year away from the cross at this point, which I think is important for us to keep in mind. Better than a year away from the cross. And you'll see, of course, that Jesus, as, as John is, is, is uh, pronouncing this for us and presenting this to us, that 
the intensity concerning doctrine and what the work of his cross was going to be uh, comes up more often. Things get intense. Um, he's just got a better than a year to go at this point. So the, P- the Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was near. And you know, you know what Passover was, right? Pesach, uh, the celebration of, of uh, Israel's deliverance out of Egypt and all that went along with that. The passing over of the angel of death and those who will have the uh, lamb's blood on the, on the doorposts, on the side, I see that, I will pass over you, prefiguring the person and work of Christ. So that Passover, the Feast of the Jews, was near. That fits into this right now. Verse 5, Therefore Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Now this large crowd, I would recommend that you take your pencil and go from the phrase large crowd back up to the word Passover in verse 4. The reason I'm saying to do that is because part of the reason there was such a large crowd must be factored into this, the the fact that Passover, one of the three primary uh, feasts of the Jews relative to the mandatory nature of uh, Jewish uh, young men up to the age 50, were required to attend in Jerusalem every year. Uh, There was Pentecost, Passover, and Tabernacles. Those were the three required ones. And so, consequently, there are Jews from all over the Roman Empire that are jammed into this area, passing through Galilee, going down into Jerusalem, and this sort of a thing. So it's important to figure that in. Jesus sees this, this large crowd, that was coming to him. By the way, that large crowd that was coming to him, that reflects back to verse 2. Verse 2, a large crowd followed him. It's that large crowd that was being pumped up following him for what reason? Yeah, they saw the signs, you know, the, right, exactly, okay, and how he's healing people, and it's that large crowd. Now, in the Greek text, there's a historical present that's used here in the end of verse 5 when it says that this large crowd was coming to him. It sort of vivifies this. It, it, it's, like, it's like the picture goes from black and white to color all of a sudden, see? It's like here comes this mess of people. I mean, Jesus is up on the mountain. Now look down towards the valley area. We don't know how high, high up he was. But it's like, here comes this horde of people, you know, as it were, over the side, and up they come. And it's a massive amount. This is the feeding of the 5,000, and that's just the men. These people are coming. That would freak any pastor out. I say, send them away. There's other places for you to go. Can't fit you in. By the way, don't want that responsibility. Thanks. See ya. I got Frank Sakura. That's it. It's as far as it goes. Everybody else has to be easy. (laughs) He sees this large crowd, bottom of five, coming to him, and he says something to Philip. Poor Philip. Andrew's going to be the poor guy after that, but here we go. He says to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? This he was saying to test him, for he himself knew uh, what he was intending to do. Philip, why did you choose Philip? I have got an answer for you. Sorry. Now, if you find something, let me know. But the commentaries don't have an answer either, all right? Why Philip? I actually, I read one guy today, and, he's, and he postured the idea that Philip was, was some kind of an administrator amongst the 12. And I'm like, what? Commentaries are good. Commentaries can also be very funny. Um, I don't know where they're getting that, but in any case, uh, why Philip? Don't know, but here goes Philip. Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Well, you know, um, there was no place to buy bread. You'd have to travel far away from this area. And there were villages, and I'm going to show you one spot we corroborate over in Mark chapter 6, but there's no place in the area. There's no ATMs. You know, the, the Kentucky Fried Chicken hasn't been built yet. There's just no place to go. The Whole Foods where you can pay through the nose, but still get decent food, is not there yet. There's no pl- I don't know. So where are we going to go? And Jesus specifically says, bottom of five, to buy bread, another way of saying food, so that these may eat. Uh, what is Jesus doing? Jesus is talking about temporary bread. That's the main heading here. The testimony of temporary bread. It doesn't last. There's nothing eternal about it. All right, where are we going to get 
this bread so that these may eat. Well, there's no place to go. You know what Jesus is doing? Right away, he's trying to eliminate from Philip and the other boys too, eliminate them uh, from a natural thinking solution. In other words, even if we do, let's talk about what it's going to take and how much money it's going to take and how are we going to run to the store in these villages and bring all this stuff back and how many cartloads of... And wouldn't it be easier just to send them packing to get their own meals? Wouldn't that be a whole lot easier? That's even going to be brought up. So he's eliminating from off the table a natural solution. Right? Where are we going to go to buy their... I, there is no place. Exactly. There's no way to do this. But then the text gives us the clue. Verse 6, this he was saying to test him, to perazo him. It's the standard word for to test, uh, or if it's, a, if it's in a temptation context, you would translate perazo, temptation. But not so in this context right here. It's a test. For he himself was saying this to test him, for he, Jesus, himself knew what he was intending to to do. Here's the test. You can look to me or you can look to yourself. You can look to me or you can look to yourself. This is the test. Now if we look to you, we look to yourself to, to fix this, this situation, this problem, to meet this need, well then right away, as you before you even get through tallying up everything that needs to be done, the money that needs to be uh, spent and, uh, and the time involved and the man hours and getting, carting the food in, and it, it's already impossible. Everybody's died from malnutrition. It's done. You know? Or they've said, forget this noise, I'm leaving. or whatever. The... So the test is you're going to look to yourself, you're going to look to me. Now, if we look to Jesus, then the, then the results dramatically change. The picture dramatically shifts. The vision shifts entirely. Now, none of these guys were expecting this. And I even get a little bit of a hint here when I compare this account here in John with the other synoptic accounts that Jesus is working off the fly just a little bit, too. He knew what he was going to do, right? Because he saw the Father do it. That's the program, according to John 5, verse 19. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing by himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. I, verse 30, I can do nothing on my own initiative. It has to be the Father doing it. Okay? Now watch what's about to happen here. This he was saying to test him, verse 6. He himself knew what he was intending to do, actually, Intending, ah, it's a little bit of, it's using a single word as a paraphrase. The Greek word there is melo, and you're familiar with that. When melo in the Greek, uh, which can mean one of two things. It's either about to, it's a word of imminence, something about to, or a word of certainty. So about to or certainty. Well, how can we tell the difference when to use which? Um, you have to be able to recognize it in the Greek. Uh, the rule is, is that if the word mellow is followed by another verb in its syntax, the way the words relate to one another in the syntax, if, the, if it's followed by another verb, mellow is a verb, if it's followed by another verb, and that verb is in the infinitive mood, because there's a, a tense, a voice, and a mood, okay, in a verb, Greek verb, that if it's in the infinitive mood, then automatically that tells us that mellow is to be translated as about to something that is about to take place, something that is soon, that is at hand, it is imminent. All right? If the word is not followed by a verb, uh, not followed by anything, if it's uh, uh, followed by a verb, but it's not a verb in the infinitive mood, maybe it's a different mood, maybe it's subjunctive, then it automatically means certainty. Mellow is certain, certain. And there's a difference between that which is certain to be and something that is about to take place. Okay, So when he says this, for he himself, bottom of six, knew what he was intending to do. I think it loses a little bit of gas in the translation. It's mellow. Uh, poieo is the word for do that follows it, and you guessed it. It's in the infinitive mood. Poieo in the infinitive mood. So mellow here is about to. Jesus knew what he was about to do. I like that. Jesus knew what he was about to do. Philip answered him after Jesus says, where are we going to buy bread so these may eat? Philip's under the spotlight now. 
poor guy, he's on the stage all by himself, this white hot lights on him, right? Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. 200 denarii, that's in, in, in their economy, in that day, that's about eight months of the average wage earner. That's about eight months of wages. The, the, listen to Philip for a second. Jesus says, where are we going to buy the food so we can feed these people? And Philip says, Philip presents the impossible. That's what he means by this. Even if eight months wages, can you imagine eight, eight months of your paychecks, right? That's how, what it would take to maybe feed this amount of people, upwards of 10,000 people, and even then, they'd only get how much? Bottom of seven. Just a little. So with men, our best effort results in loss and insignificant results. And nobody's getting full. Nobody's having their need met. So temporary bread? Ah. Let's shift gears just a little bit here because we want a better outcome. He says 200 a denarii worth of bread is not sufficient, not enough for them, for everyone to receive just a little. So Philip's response is to the challenge. Now Jesus is right there. He's proved himself time and over the last year, Philip has watched it, watched it all. Well, not quite all, but seen quite some incredible stuff. And so he presents Jesus. His answer is, can't be done. Can't be done, Lord. Can't be done. And even if it could, they're only just going to get a little. It's not going to meet their need. See, this is the testimony of temporary bread. Temporary bread? Our earthly responses, our natural responses, when the circumstance takes place and we hear from the doctor or we get the bill and we can't pay it, you know, our immediate thinking is, uh, let's start doing the math. Let's see how we can squeeze every you know, drop of monetary significance out of these pennies that I got. We naturally run that way, don't we? Instead of, you know, in other words, we're like, we're like Philip responding to Jesus' question right here. But Jesus is right there. Jesus is not concerned with this. Jesus is not saying, I, do you read it here? I haven't read it yet, but maybe it's in some lost manuscript somewhere. At that moment, Jesus took off his hat and started passing it around because we need some money to make this happen. Which leaves us then moving from the first point into the second point, the testimony, testimony of a temporary provision. The temporary provision that you're going to see here has to do with this bread, this physical bread. And it's going to come about through uh, extra natural means. I'd rather say that than supernatural. Extra natural means. It's fabulous the way this is going to happen. But it's still temporary bread. It still doesn't meet their total need. What did Jesus say? Who did Jesus say he was? In verse 51, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, meaning himself, he will live forever. Not this other stuff. Uh, verse 49, your fathers ate manna, <clears throat> physical, temporary bread, in the wilderness, and what? Died. There's nothing eternal about it. It's just temporary. Jesus is teaching, get your eyes off of the physical circumstance, get your eyes off physical bread as if that's meeting your need. You might physically starve, but you'll have your eternal need met by the bread that comes from God out of heaven. Testimony of a temporary provision starts in verse 8. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Preter's brother, said to him, There is a lad here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are these for so many people? All right, now let's get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more color into this picture, and I'm going to have you hold your spot here and go with me to Mark 6. Mark chapter 6, and let's start at verse 33. Mark 6, verse 33. Let's see if we can fill in some holes here. <clears throat> Same historical situation here that's going on in John chapter 6. You'll even see the similarity in John 5 with what's happening uh, in verse 31 and 32 of Mark 6, for instance. 
But in verse 33, it says, The people saw them going, many recognized them, and ran there um, together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. When Jesus went ashore, see, they're on the Sea of Galilee, also known as the Sea of... Ah, good. When Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd, felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, This place is desolate, and it is already quite late. Send them away. The disciples are saying this to Jesus. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. See, John passes over this. He knows Matthew and Mark have already covered this. John was the last gospel written. Instead, John gives us some additional information that the other fellows don't give. But notice what the boys are saying to Jesus. Practical. Is this practical? Is this wrong? It's not really wrong. I mean, you know, it's late. We're tired. They're tired. Time to eat. In fact, they're basically saying, we want to eat too. Uh, let's send them away so they're not a drain on us anymore. And we can start the campfire rolling and, you know, do our thing. So send them away. 37, but he answered them, you give them something to eat. Well, they don't want to hear that. Notice how Jesus turned right. He made other people's needs the disciples' responsibility. Uh, I would recommend to you that the exact same thing is true of you or I. That other people's needs God brings into our lives become our responsibility. You give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? Now see, they said this in addition to what Philip said to Jesus. Now we don't know what the chronology of that was between Mark 6 and John 6. Did Jesus approach Philip first and Philip said 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't even feed this whole multitude, they only get a little? Uh, Did that happen first or did this statement happen first? Well, it doesn't really make any difference. What you can bank on is that both statements took place. It's not a contradiction contradiction is something that is contrary to what was spoken diction <laughs> well this is not this is in this is additional information jesus says shall we go and spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something to eat? i think that philip's statement to jesus happened first and the disciples heard this and that's why they said this to jesus they heard philip say that that's my opinion on the matter uh, you don't have to buy it um i don't have a price tag on it or anything but um 38, and he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go look. (laughs) And when they found out, they said, five and two fish. Now, I I find this to be fascinating. He tells them, how many loaves do you have? What do you have? What do you have in your hand? Go look. Well, the boys didn't have much, but they did come across a little kid who had these five dried up pieces of stinking barley loaves, that's peasant food, and two stinking sardines. Mmm, baby, I want some of that. Back to John 6. Now that you've heard all that, verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a lad over here. In other words, we don't have it. Uh, Whether they actually had anything or they were hoarding it, I don't know. Did Andrew and the other boys, when they realized they don't have much of anything, start fanning out and combing the people that were a part of the crowd? I don't know, maybe, but they came up with this kid. And verse 9 says, there's a lad here, Andrew tells Jesus, who has five barley loaves and two fish. Now, that's cheap food. Barley was a cheap grain back in the first century. It didn't cost much of anything to have, easy to grow, you know, very little maintenance, but barley loaves, when you, we hear the word loaf, you know, we tend to think Wonder Bread loaf or, you know, whatever, Roman meal or whatever the deal is you eat. Uh, I hope you don't eat either one of those caustic things, by the way. But uh, loaves, these, these barley, uh-uh, man, we're talking pancake. They're just flat. And, uh, and uh, then he's got these two fish. Now, the Greek word here that's used for fish, according to Moulton and Milligan, in their vocabulary of the Greek New Testament, they say that this specific word that's used here for fish really has to do with a fish or a process which resulted in in pickled fish. Pickled. Now, we're not talking about the way that they pickle a cucumber and it turns into pickles you throw on your hamburger kind of a thing. 
We're talking about the reason the thing was pickled, these fish. Uh, I don't know how he was transporting it, but I'm pretty sure he didn't have an igloo cooler. Pretty sure about that. And so here's this kid. He is probably Maybe it was in a basket. Maybe it was just wrapped up in some cloth or something like that. Was it his lunch? I don't know, you know. I don't know. Maybe the kid collected it. I have no idea. But he had five of these dry, all day in the sun, no refrigeration, the hot Galilean sun, and it's doing its job on that bread and on those fish. Pickled by God. I'm going to make a meal out of this. But I haven't got enough, or I haven't got the right thing, Lord. I don't think I can make this requirement. I can't reach the deadline. I haven't been a Christian long enough. I haven't prayed. I don't know enough of the Bible. you know. And we're always doing that. When the circumstance challenges us, the first thing we do is we look at what we can't do, and we begin to enunciate that and give life to it. And then we find somebody to agree with us about that. Like Philip found Andrew. Because look what Andrew's going to say next. Bottom of nine. Barley loaves, two fish. But what are these for so many people? In other words, I agree with Philip. I agree with Philip. Bottom of verse seven. Not sufficient for them for everyone to receive a little. So what we got here is we got Philip and Andrew are now in agreement over this. Now they're empowered. So you can be in agreement over something according to faith or something according to fear something according to failure, and you will empower one another in that. See, if, if you are in agreement in regards to faith relative to a promise in the word, like in this case, Christ's provision, he's the eternal bread, if you're in agreement with your other brother or sister or brothers and sisters over that, what does that make you do? That makes you stand on that promise, believing God, speaking as much, and if there's anything that is required relative to a faith action, you are out there up off your couch and doing that. But a person that has agreed with another person that failure is the option and it's too hard for us and it's impossible, they, are now, they have now ratcheted themselves hard fast to the wall of failure, as it were. And what motiva- there is no motivation for it. In other words, they're, they're done. They're a cadaver now. It's over with. It's like I, I, I used to tell my son, and it's like I've told uh, other young people, and unfortunately some adults, who are out looking for work. Um, if you keep at it, there are jobs to find here in Omaha. There are plenty of jobs to find. We know what the situation is. People just don't want to do what those jobs are. Isn't that too darn bad? Plenty of, and I say to them, you keep looking, and you keep pounding, and I guarantee you will get a job. In fact, it's like Ann and I have talked about, your job needs to be eight hours a day you looking for a job. And if you do that, you will get a job. But I guarantee you, on the other hand, that if you stop, I guarantee you, you will not get a job. And that's all there is to it. It's as simple as that. But as soon as we get with somebody else, and it could be a positive uh, agreement, but if it's a negative agreement, you got this happening right too. So basically, Andrew and Philip are worthless right now. They're worthless to Jesus right now. That leaves him with ten guys, and one of them is a devil. So what does Jesus say? Verse 10. Jesus said, you guys are right. I ain't got time for this anyway. Let's just move on down the road. Hit it! Jesus said, have the men, not people, it's anthropon, have the men sit down. Down. Now, there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down in number about 5,000. Hold on. What? What? No, Jesus. <laughs> now, we, we don't have it. We, we don't. We can't do it. We've already determined this. The Andrew Philip Consortium Council Era has met, and that's that, and we can't. There's a kid here with some dried up this and stinky that, and you want to hand this to you? I'd like to see you take a bite of just that fish head right there. I don't think we're going to pass. And Jesus says, have the men sit down. Now, not just sit down, not sit down on your backside. That's not the Greek right here. 
The Greek right there is anapipto. Anapipto means to recline. It means to lean on one arm while having the other arm free as you're laid out Cleopatra style as you, as you would. In other words, this idea of reclining, this is the position that, that, that Jewish men and women would take at the table at home at the end of the day. It's not a breakfast position. It's not a lunch position because those positions were quick and you often ate you know, on the run, quick lunch, quick, quick breakfast, and you're out into the field because we're burning daylight. That was their thing. But at night, everything is relaxed, and you would lean, and you would recline. And that was their time that they took positions as kings, which they, spiritually, they, they believed they could be that, and they took that position within their own home, and the food was laid out on the, on the short table, and you would recline and lean. You'd have one hand free to sort of graze around at the food and eat what you want, you know, and burp and all that good stuff, and, you know, and talk about the day. It's relaxed. That's the word that Jesus tells them right there. What's Jesus saying? You've presented me with garbage. And now I'm going to make it into a feast. And that's the position they were to take. He told the disciples, get them in a right frame of mind. Don't just have them sit down. And it must have been weird for them. I wonder how many of them didn't do it. Certainly, most of them did. He said, recline. Get ready, because something great is coming. Jesus says this in light of and in the face of Philip and Andrew's unbelief and agreement to fail, that something was impossible. Now, there was much grass in that place, which, by the way, tells us this happened sometime during the spring, obviously Passover time. So the men reclined, same word, anapipto, reclined in number about 5,000, Matthew 14.21, Matthew 14.21 tells us there were 5,000 men plus the women and the children. That's where we get that from, Matthew 14.21. So what does Jesus do? Verse 11, Jesus took the loaves. Jesus took this dried up, crumbling five pieces of yuck and having given thanks, yeah, he gave thanks for this junk. I think not so much for the condition of the food, but giving thanks to what God was going to do. Remember, Jesus didn't do anything that he didn't see the Father do. So here we go. He saw the fathers do this. Gave thanks, and then it says, he distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. Maybe you let go of it already. I didn't tell you to hold it. But one more quick look at Mark 6 and just one verse, verse 41, that will help us amplify what I just read. Mark, uh, Mark 6, 41. I just read to you that in 6, 11 of John, he gave thanks. He distributed to those who were seated, likewise also of the fish, as much as they wanted. Now in Mark 6, 41, a little more illumination. He, Christ, took the five loaves and the two fish. And looking up towards heaven, he blessed. Now, John says he gave thanks. Uh, this is not a contradiction. It's an addition to. It's additional information. Jesus gave thanks, and then he blessed it. He blessed it because he saw the Father bless it. He blessed it and broke the loaves. Now, watch the verbiage here in Mark 6:41. And he kept giving them to the disciples to set before them, and he divided up the two fish among them all. Jesus breaks it, and what's, here's the picture. Yes, he divided it up amongst them all, but now Mark tells us, 641, that he did it through the medium of the twelve, the disciples. Now, that would include Philip and Andrew. What a lesson for these two guys, right? Who weren't, weren't really believing this. They weren't in that position. And so what is happening here is that the miracle, you go back to John 6 now, the miracle that is taking place is Jesus has got the food in his hand, he's got the fish, he's got the, the loaves, and he's He's breaking off a piece, and he hands it to John. Breaks off a piece, hands it to Peter. Breaks off a piece, and they go off with it. Go, go, go give that away. Deal with that. Well, Lord, I can probably cover more ground if you give me more. No, uh, do what's in your hand to do right now. Do what you know you need to do now, and then more will come. People are always, Christians are coming to me, and they're going, you know, gosh, I just want this. I've been waiting and waiting. Well, what has God given you to do right now? Well, I, I'm waiting for him to... No, but what has he got you doing right now? Well, what do you mean? Well, you know, what is your latest opportunity? Well, I don't have any opportunities. You don't have any opportunities? Really? 
Um, you didn't hear the pastor say on, on Sunday they needed help in the nursery? You didn't hear the pastor say that there was a need to, and so-and-so needs a ride, or we need somebody to paint, or... Here. Now, deal with that. Take that, what I just gave you, and then come back, and I'll give, be faithful, and then... So he's given it out. The miracle, listen now, the miracle transformation in the additional food as that loaf and the, the fish, who, which all of a sudden, because he blessed it, was no longer garbage. Now, it's like the best tasting thing you ever had in your life. It is the filet, filet, filet thank you, sis, filet mignon of peasant bread and fish. And I've never had fish like this before. And we're reclining and we're having a feast. And Jesus is handing this great stuff out now that he has blessed. And the miracle is happening and the boys are distributing the miracle of Christ. The boys are distributing what Christ has transformed. And you're the boys. You're the twelve. Jesus does the miracle. We have the honor of distributing that. And it's like, you like that? You want more? Hang on. I know the chef. <laughs> Go back to Jesus. Okay. And he says, and he says, uh, verse 11, now Jesus then took the loaves, having given thanks, distributed to those who were seated. Likewise, watch, also of the fish, as much as they wanted. I don't want junk. I don't want garbage. When it's good, I want more. And as much as they wanted. This stuff was great. It's kind of like, this is hot on the heels of John chapter 2. The water into wine at Cana. It's the best wine. Anybody? Right? The, the steward comes to the, to, the, to the bridegroom and he says, this latest wine that you brought out, man, we only bring out the best stuff after people are well drunk. You bring this stuff out, I mean, first, and then you bring it out later. That doesn't make any sense. It was the best wine. So this is the best bread and the best fish. And they're in a position reclining, having a feast as much as they wanted. You know we got some folks out there that can pack it away. You know every culture does. As much as they wanted. Brings us to the third and final point. Testimony of a temporary total. We're just dealing with temporality here. Focusing in, in contrast, that which is temporal in contrast to that which is eternal. And this is going to, that idea, that theme is going to flow throughout this sixth chapter. Verse 12. And when they were filled, man, I'm full. You know, it's like the whole Thanksgiving thing, and you're like distended belly and the whole nine yards, right? And now it's just the tryptophan has taken over, and I just got to go to sleep, right? And when they were filled, Christ said to his disciples, Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. Gather up the leftover fragments. Leftover fragments? Wait a minute. Didn't Philip and Andrew already do the math on this? Did that they already? See, sometimes practical and actual need to give way to the impossible miracle. In fact, I would say most of the time it needs to be that way. Instead of positioning ourselves and responding to the circumstance in the impossible way, instead of responding to this in the natural way, why don't we follow Jesus? Why don't we be, verse 3, one of his disciplined learners? Why don't we do that? We're, the Bible is loaded with promises. Jesus gave us tons of promises. You know my teaching on this. Jesus was direct and absolute in regards to this faith thing. Direct and it was there was nothing balanced about Jesus at all. No, completely imbalanced. You know why, what I mean about that? There was no safety net. There was no safety net. Jesus said, "Jump." There was no safety net. Jump. I'll catch you. Peter, come on out into the boat. Lord, if that's you, tell me to walk on the water. Come on, let's go. Peter gets on the boat, out of the boat, walks on the water. 
No safety net. Walks on the water. Then got his eyes off Jesus. You know the rest of the story. Began to sink. Lord, help me. Because we have a merciful Savior. Immediately, the text is, immediately, he's there to grab you. You're not going to sink. And then he says, O you of little faith, oligopisteo. The best way I can illustrate the meaning of that word in Greek is little faith, little, just a little bit, right? Just squeaking out faith, just a little squeaky faith. Yeah, that's it. Oh, you oligopisteo, why did you doubt? That's a question that Jesus meant for him to think about that. Answer my question. Why did you doubt? Because you were succeeding. You were doing it. You were doing the impossible. Who or what made you think otherwise? It's just like when Paul wrote to the Galatians, fourth chapter of, of Galatians. You know, man, you guys, who's doing this to you? Who has be, or third chapter? Who has bewitched you? Who has put a spell on you to walk away from justification by faith and start doing the law? Who's doing that to you? Gather up, verse 12, the leftover fragments so that nothing is lost. Apolumai is our Greek word behind lost right there. It's primary meaning. Lost is fine. The primary meanings have to do with uh, perishing or ruin, ruination. Gather up the testimony. Gather up the evidence so that nothing is brought into ruination. I don't think Jesus was so much concerned with the uh, status of the food as much as he was concerned with the individuals who partook of the food and especially those 12 boys who knew where that food came from. And guess who's picking this up? Who's he telling to pick this up? The 12, the boys. That means the boys are running around the field, maybe having to fight with some people. Kid, give me that. Okay, you've had enough. Give. Uh, I don't know. But they all got baskets. And they're filling their baskets, and there's a reason for that. Here we go. Gather up the leftover fragments so that nothing will be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments. Now these baskets right here, the Greek word here for this basket, it means a, a small hand basket, um, something portable. You know, uh, when, it's, when we get into the, the feeding of the 4,000, the seven baskets, remember the feeding of the 4,000? That's coming up, right? It's not coming up, uh, well, soon. Uh, feeding of the 4,000, these are large laundry baskets where it, with the feeding of the 5,000, the 12 baskets full of fragments are hand baskets, lunch pail type baskets, okay? Easily portable. Now, that's what's going on right now. Uh, wow, there are more fragments, more testimony, more faith-filled results that are left over testifying to Andrew and to Philip, the absolute impossibility of what they were seeing. Now here's what's neat. They gather up, verse 13, filled the 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves and, <laughs> which were left over by those who had eaten. See, the people partook. They ate of it. They sampled it. This is real. They came in contact with it. They ate the miracle. They participated in the miracle, but the miracle didn't save them. The miracle didn't change them. It wasn't for them. Man, I thought there was up to like 10,000 people. It really wasn't for them. This whole thing was for the disciples. It was so that they would begin to know that this is temporary bread, and I'm Lord over it. And if you're going to work in my kingdom, you've got to dump the... 200 denarii worth is not enough to be take a little. You've got to dump that. And he says, Therefore, when the people, verse 14, saw the sign which he performed, they said, This is truly the prophet who has come into the, into the world. By the way, before we hit verse 14, back in verse 13, these 12 baskets, that means each of the boys had a basket, right? During that whole time, they were working. They were passing out the food that Jesus was multiplying. You know, the, the, the laborers worthy of his hire. didn't say the boys were eating. They all picked up a basket. It was for them. It was for them to eat. 
practically speaking. It was for them. Jesus didn't forget about them. He doesn't forget about his servants and those whom he uses, if we will believe him for it. Each one of them had a lunch, and each one of them had a testimony. That it's not impossible, that he's the God of the impossible, who makes it possible. And then the people, of course, when they saw the sign which he had performed, said, well, this is the prophet who's coming to the world. That's a reference to Deuteronomy 18, 15, and following, which we've talked about before. That expression, the prophet, came up in the first chapter of John, if you will recall, when the uh, representatives from the priests in Jerusalem went to John the Baptist, and they said, are you the Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are you the prophet? Ho prophetes, definite article preceding. And he said, no, I'm not. The meaning for that is back in Deuteronomy 18.50, which actually is a messianic prophecy, Deuteronomy 18.15, but the Jews of Jesus' day were interpreting that largely as uh, a reference to a separate prophet other than the Messiah. They had that multiple personality thing going on with Messiahs like crazy. In any case, this is what the people had heard, and they figured, well, this is the guy. But Jesus' response, once again, just like in verse 3, after the crowds were coming, right? Jesus didn't go to the crowds. He went up to the mountain. No, I'm not playing that game. So in verse 15, so Jesus perceiving that they were intending, by the way, it's mellow again with the infinitive following, that they were about to come and take him by force, or pazo him, seize him, by force, and make him king. So Jesus withdraws again to the mountain by himself alone. Because according to Matthew 14 and Mark 6, the other two synoptic accounts, before this happened, Jesus saw it was starting to happen. Jesus took the boys down to the lake, down to the shoreline of Galilee, put them in a boat, and sent them a rowing. And he went back to dismiss the crowd, and then he left that crowd. Because that crowd was evidencing what? They were evidencing John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. Again, Jesus, here they, we believe in you because of the signs. That's illegitimate. Therefore, I will not epistusen, I will not entrust faith back to you, because I know what's in you. You just want me to be your king. I've come to die. I've come to save. I have not come to be your king in the earthly political sense. And so what does Jesus do? Bottom of 15, he withdrew. He pulls away from them. That's right. Jesus pulls away for pe from people who come at him for the wrong reason. John chapter 2, 23 through 25, and right here again. And we've seen it before. We've seen it earlier. He withdraws again to the mountain by himself, and then there's this last stab of emphasis, alone. Alone. The boys are gone. The boys are out, and they're about to get into another lesson that is directly related to this multiplying of the loaves and the fishes. They're going to be, we'll look at it next week, they're going to be out on the lake, and you know what's coming. The storm's coming, right? And after this whole thing is over with, one of the remarks that one of the gospel writers is going to make about their condition was that their hearts were hard because they didn't understand the lesson of the loaves and the fishes. And they, were, they had let fear in because of that. And I'm not letting the punchline you know, escape. There's more to that than just that. So, Lord willing, next week we will jump into that. Lord God, we give you praise and thanks.